And we've heard today a lot about the debt crisis. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that is one of the greatest threats to human development that the countries in the global south are facing at the moment. As far back as three years ago, 64 countries in the global south were already spending more on interest payments on their debt than they were on healthcare. And that was in the midst of a pandemic, and that was before interest rates started rising so much. So that situation is already becoming desperate. We heard as well earlier about how states, creditors, credit states, credit institutions are very quick to bring up this question of moral hazard. If we write off the debt, what's going to stop them from, uh, from doing this all over again? Well, aside from the structure of the international system that created that debt in the first place, those conversations never happen when it's banks that need to get bailed out. When it's you know Silicon Valley Bank, when it's um, you know the banks that cause financial crisis, these questions of moral hazard are entirely absent. So again, we come back to this situation of just blatant hypocrisy that really sustains and maintains this divide that we see between the global south. And we know how states in the global north get away with this hypocrisy. It's because of these imbalances of power, and that's really what I want to talk about: is how we start to correct for these imbalances of power that exist at the global level, but also that exist within our societies individually. Um, because, you know, I'd really like to think to say about having to link the mutiny in the global north with the mutiny in the global south. Because yes, we have so many differences, so many inequalities um, that, uh, that sustain um, that unequal relationship. But as movements, we have also so much to learn from each other. And I think it's really important to come back to this because so often when we have these discussions, we're told that we have this you know, there are two paths to development. There's developmentalism or there's neoliberalism. And you pick one up and you choose one and you do it, right? But that isn't true. Whether or not you pick which model is determined by the social structures within your society as a whole. It's not a coincidence that all of the most powerful states in the world, the most powerful financial institutions, the biggest multinational corporations, have neoliberal models of economic governance. It's because of the pressure that those institutions are able to wield over those domestic governments. So how do we start building a movement that allows us to counter that pressure at the global level? And how do we start talking about some similarities that can unite our movement as we fight for these things all around the world? As some of you may know, after this trust came to power in my country, England, England is now, for all intents and purposes, an emerging market economy which may be surprising to some of the places that uh, have been colonized by us over the course of the last several centuries. But there is a serious point there, which is that decades of neoliberalism have led to the erosion of the public realm, have led to the erosion of our public services, have led to poverty and inequality on a scale that we haven't seen in the UK and in many other countries in the global north for a very long time. The weight of climate breakdown is obviously being borne disproportionately by states in the global south, despite the fact that it's been caused by the global north, but that is a challenge that we do face together. We know that the wealth of the global north is premised upon extraction from the global, from the global south, but how does that take place? Through massive multinational institutions and financial organisations that corrupt our governments as well in the global north and skew our democracies away from um, ordinary people and towards the interests of the rich. And perhaps more importantly than all of that, we're facing a crisis of democracy, partly to do with the outsized weight that those powerful interests have over our democratic uh, systems, but also due to the structure of the international system, due to the structures that we've all been talking about, that we all participate in so much, and the outsized weight that those give to not just countries in the global north, but the vested interests that hold so much power over the policy that is developed in those countries. So there are you know, so many threats, so many challenges that we're facing at the moment as, as this movement, but there are also opportunities. We've seen uh, this discussion about de-dollarization. It was something like over 70% of global central bank reserves were held in dollars as many as 20 years ago, and now it's, less, it's just over 60. That's a huge change. We're seeing changes in the way that you know, global lending and finance is taking place. We're seeing, in many ways, the emergence of a kind of bipolar world order, which carries with it threats as well as opportunities. But um, you know, the thing that I really want to end by, by reflecting on is um, something that I've learned literally over the course of the last 24 hours by speaking to our comrades from Honduras who were talking about the unbelievable uh, injustice that's taken place in Honduras over the course of the last several years, where private cities have been built up in Honduras that are supposed to act as havens for international capital, like the enterprise zones that we see in parts of the global north, um, like free ports, like all of these attempts to kind of entrench neoliberal governments at the local level. And of course, when a progressive government comes to power and says we have had enough of this, what happens? 
international arbitration through um, ISDS and investor state dispute settlements that so many of us around this table will have so much familiarity with and that people will have familiarity with losing. You know, states, citizens in the global south disproportionately lose those cases. But there are also situations in which people have won. And I take hope from that. I take hope from this campaign that we won in Honduras. And I take hope from what happened in El Salvador, where a community, a small community, a small group of ordinary people came together with activists, with policymakers from actually around the world and launched a campaign to kick out mining companies that were basically leaving arsenic in the water of El Salvador um, and won an ISDS case, won a historic ISDS case. Um, and they did not do that on their own. You know, you speak to the people that were involved in that, that campaign and they said, were it not for the support that we had, were it not for meetings like this, where they were able to bring those um, issues to people from around the world, that case might not have been won. So for me, looking out from where we go next, I really want to be able to build this campaign alongside Honduras and see where we can learn from each other, see what campaigns we need to work on together to actually really start to put meat on the bones of how we rebuild what should be a global movement for um, a new international economic order. Thank you.